Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Um, for those of you that were joining us via the app, no, I'm not Amy. Unfor unfortunately, she wasn't very well this morning, so I am just standing in for her. I'm Rachel Evans. I'm the Managing Director of Cantar Marketplace here in the UK. So if you haven't seen all of our branding around here today, I've got it on a T-shirt just ready for you as well. Uh, and I'd like to introduce you to George, who's one of our key clients at Cantar from Reckitt. Uh, he's currently working in the hygiene team. Uh, or was working in the hygiene team, now he's working in the health team. Uh, and he's here today to talk about his journey on consumer closeness and how we can make sure that we help that change the world in our research world. So whenever I've spoken to or listened uh, to clients over the last few years, one of the key things we've really seen is they're grappling with two really difficult fundamental challenges. Uh, the first is really the sheer speed um, at which their markets, industries, competition is all evolving, largely fueled by technology, a lot of that here today. And the second is really about the complexity of those markets and industries, but also that increasingly nuanced consumer needs and wants and trends that are out there. And actually, both of those have been exacerbated really over the last three years. I think if I'd been here in 2019 and said we were about to hit a global pandemic, a war in Europe, um, and huge uh, inflation of a generation, uh, then we'd have probably all run over and probably headed straight to the bar or locked ourselves in a cupboard. But I think being able to move at speed now in the backdrop to that is ever increasing and more important. And actually, in listening to our clients, and particularly listening to George, uh, the Herculean efforts that him and his team have gone to at Reckitt's, um, both clients and their agency partners can really work together to make a fundamental change uh, in this place. And that allows us to make sure that our brands and your brands not just survive, but actually thrive. So, George, let's get on with yourself and tell us all about it. Tell us where this all started for you and your team. Well, our story started about a year and a half ago when our internal employee satisfaction survey suggested that our employees, and even more so our marketeers, our marketing team, was feeling very disconnected from consumers. So they didn't feel the consumers were represented enough in their decision making. And as us, naturally, CMI kicked off this amazing, you know, um, work stream internally that was aiming to finally drive consumer centricity and bring the consumer at the heart of what we do. But what the hell is this consumer centricity? Hmm? Sounds quite out there, right? Sounds just, just a fancy theoretical thing. But actually, in my opinion, it's a very, very tangible thing. So let's break it down, shall we? So I guess consumer centricity needs to start with everyone's involvement. People need to be hooked into the, way, to the idea that we need to be consumer centric. This cannot be just you know, a task force like everything else, you know, where marketers are expecting just marginal improvements and, you know, they don't really have to do something about it and nothing's going to change anyway and they don't have time at the end of the day, right? No, it needs to start with a punch in the gut. In our case, for example, one of the things that we did was we've invited one of those external motivational speakers to talk to us about insights. So it was quite a lot, you know, using real case examples about What's an insight? What, you know, what's a good insight? What do you do with it? But also, they hit us with some hard-hitting facts. For example, the average lifespan of a brand, until a few years ago, it would stretch all the way to decades. Whereas now, the same lifespan is streamed down all the way to just a handful of years. And that's because brands struggle, especially in these turbulent times, to listen to consumers effectively and efficiently. So that's how you start getting people to understand that consumer centricity, it's not just about uh, success. Quite a lot of it is about survival. Yeah. So is getting people intrigued about consumer centricity enough to get them to actually be? No, because there's a huge barrier, and the barrier is time. Now, I'm about to say something very controversial here. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> you can circulate as many pieces of research as you want, you can send out white papers, you can invite people to webinars, you can send out podcasts or whatever, an interesting material. Marketers do not have time. And I can see a few heads nodding. <laughs> Marketers don't have time. I mean, you know, their the, the mailboxes are littered with emails like that. And 
Um, you know, they, they, they do try the effort to, they, they do do the effort to show up, but you can see them responding to emails and, and you know, just IMing because they don't have the time. You need to make the insights delivery in turn interesting and intriguing for them to actually want to show up. One of the things that we did in our case was we branded and we did our very own learning cafes. So what's a learning cafe? It's a casual, short, punchy, quirky, at times, insights delivery presentation yeah. um, from external speakers, experts in the fields, talking to us about, you know, topics that we internally have voted for and shortlisted, so things that are interesting to our marketers. And coffee is not mandatory, but very highly recommended. And you would see that people would start showing up. It was only 20, 25 minutes of the time. But the idea was to intrigue them and to get them to start having, you know, ideas and things they wanted to explore further. And that sounds like really engaging and quite game changing overall. But did you find that that helped and that changed the marketeers' behaviors? Well, not quite, because it doesn't work just like this. I mean, naturally, Right? The marketer would come up with all of these ideas and topics that they wanted to explore, and they would reach out to the lovely CMI team. Um, but there's another problem there. You see, until a few years ago, in order to do, to do the CMI profession, all you had to do was to be proficient enough in maybe quantitative, qualitative research, mm. right? maybe understand some basic statistics, some basic analytics. But in the last few years, a lot of new terms are making it into the CMI glossary. Now you need to understand hyper-targeting, you need to understand omni-channel, e-commerce, digital, social listening, all of these stuff. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that the CMI job is becoming more difficult over time. At the same time, budgets are becoming strict. Mm. At the end of the day, most companies, they start these days with zero-based budgeting approach, right? So you need to be relatively careful with every penny that you spend. And between us, the CMI teams are not getting any bigger, are they? So basically, you've got a more difficult job, Maybe not as much um, resource and not as much money. So in turn, CMIs do not have time either. So what we thought for tackling this, and I'm about to say also something controversial, is to give direct access to marketers to consumers. So in our case, we built this 3,000 consumer community, our very own panel of 3,000 consumers who were engaged with our categories, we liked our categories, and they wanted to talk about them. And then this amazing resource would be at the tip of the marketer's finger, yeah. right? Easily accessible through a series of tools and methodologies. For example, we have those DIY quantitative, semi-automated tools, quantitative tools, or you, know, you could very easily book a Consumer Connect, which is a one-on-one -on -one consumer conversation. Or you could just post a question to see what you know, consumers had to say. And I guess that naturally got people to be able to yeah. speak and reach out to consumers directly. And what I think is great about this idea is that since you don't have all of these little questions flowing through CMI but going directly to consumer, then the, the Lean and Agile CMI team has enough time to support mm -hmm. the transformational program and support consumer centricity and to work on the bigger and the more strategic questions. Yeah. And it sounds slightly scary, but I imagine for the insights team particularly, that's really compelling and really engaging because of them being able to focus on that more strategic work, right? That's actually true, even though it would have been a very boring story to tell today if it was working just like this. You see, when naturally, when someone who is not necessarily a trained researcher or a trained moderator has any interaction with whatever methodology with a the consumer, there is this natural tendency to, you know, take away the things that they want to take away, maybe hear the things they want to mm -hmm. hear, maybe pick up, you know, the little pieces of insight that support the story or maybe, you know, purposefully neglect the ones yeah, that don't, yeah. right? And I guess that, that's totally natural, and we've all been there, every CMI actually at some point, we've been there. Um, but the job of the CMI is to objectively represent the voice of the consumer in business decision making. You cannot factor out the objectivity and still think that you can be consumer centric. In our case, we thought of one or two ways of tackling this. Mm. We built an offsite team, one of our vendors, whose job was twofold. Firstly, to support the marketers in, in this journey from, from little things like 
what should the discussion guide look like? Or how should I formulate this question in, in a correct manner? Or what sense should I make of this data? Or what are consumers actually telling me here? Um, but in the, in the longer run, in the mid and the longer term, what we were going to do was to upskill our marketers on CMI topics. In my humble opinion, the only way to actually be consumer-centric is to have every marketer understand the CMI principles mm. to the level of a junior CMI. And that's actually how you jump 20 percentage points in that bloody internal survey <laughs> when it gets to how you know, close <laughs> people feel to consumers. Yeah. And I mean, you said that, that 20 percentage points, you know, you mentioned that to me previously. It's, you know, it's a great difference to make for your marketing team. Uh, you must have been incredibly proud of that. But, you know, you've just, you've said a lot of controversial things. It makes it sound it wasn't like an easy path, right? So what made this work for you? What are those little golden nuggets that made it work? It totally wasn't. Obviously, it's a journey. <laughs> um, but I guess in order to make something like that work, you need the right mindset. And the way it worked for us is by thinking lean and agile. Now, I know lean and agile is also a buzzword, and everyone wants to be lean and agile these days and what have you. Um, but for me, the way I like to describe it is, think of it as being in the shoes of a new, young entrepreneur, right? You're in your late 20s, you've just started your first business, you have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> your bank account is running dry, your money is running out, your time is running out and you're just trying to connect your customers and your clients and your consumers with whichever way you can find, whatever methodology or way that might be, in order to get good enough information or insights, in order to pivot your proposition enough in order to keep going. I guess the point I'm trying to make is you can't always have these amazing pieces of research where everything is detailed and you know the repercussions of every decision you're going to make, and totally you don't, excuse me, you don't have a bottomless pit of money that you can mm -hmm. spend on stuff. So you need, the right, you need the right lean and agile mindset, mm. especially when you're navigating uncharted waters. And that happens way too often lately, doesn't it? Navigating uncharted waters. Think of purpose, for example. And I know that's also another buzzword and everyone wants to be purposeful and whatever, but in reality, consumers have higher trust in brands and organizations to have a positive impact on society and the environment as opposed to governments. So brands can be a force of good, mm. and they should be a force of good. Mm. The problem is, how do you infuse purpose to a brand that until yesterday was just you know, a functional brand, keeping mm. people happy with products and services, without seemingly retrospectively fitting purpose or walk washing? Mm. And that's a challenge, I think. Absolutely. And, well, maybe the last 24 hours in government, more people are going to put their faith in brands than they did 24 hours ago. Um, but we also know that brands that simply talk about purpose uh, or sustainability, you know, it doesn't equal success. And the work we've done at Kantar, you know, when you, when you build purpose with something that authentically fits with your brand that it's already known for, that's when the true magic happens. And we see that brands can improve their equity, you know, threefold uh, when they get it right. So, you know, let's, let's have a chat about that in reality and your purpose journey with one of your brands. Yeah, it's true. It's totally true, but I guess the problem is no one knows how to do that. <laughs> and one of the brands that spearheaded purpose for us was Vanish. Some of you might know Vanish as, you know, a historical stain remover product. Some others might know it as the ultimate laundry additive whose aim is to prolong the lives of your clothes. Now, we knew what our fight should be. We knew what our fight should be. Fast fashion is the second largest pollutant on the planet. Every minute, thousands of garments end up in the landfill. And imagine as well the water that goes into manufacturing. Imagine as well the CO2 emissions in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. Even prolonging the lives of your clothes for even just a tiny bit can have a heck of an impact. Now, as I said, the problem is we didn't know how to do it. So we naturally sat down you know, with our marketing team, our creative partners, the CMI team was there as well. We came up with about a dozen of creative uh, routes and, and and campaign ideas, and we tested those in sequence in uh, the counter link methodology, and they all tested in a very concise fashion. Fail, 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 and fail. So, as you understand, with projects like that, timings tend to be quite rigid, and you need to show up, obviously, you know, in the respective forums and, 
and present your progress. So, in this particular case, we did use our suppliers' um, lean and agile technology. We managed to run a meta-analysis in a matter of, of days, literally, and we used the lean tools to you know, have a holistic view around what we had tested and other learnings that we had to figure out what we're doing well, what not, what's working, what's not, etc. But as I always like to say, agile technology is one thing, but nothing can replace the impeccable human capital. So we had our partners from a research agency coming in and helping us you know, look a bit beyond the greens and the reds and the yellows of these amazing scorecards and help make sense of the data and, and just look beyond the data. And at a place where there was no blueprint for doing purpose, we built our own, we built our own framework. And whilst it's proprietary and I cannot tell much about it, what I can tell you is that at the back of it, um, at the back of this piece of work, we, we put together three new um, campaign ideas yep. for Vanish Purpose. We tested those as well with Kantar Link, and by the end of it, we also had to argue again out of which out of three very strong copies to actually uh, put forward for further development and for shooting. Okay. And I believe one of those we can share with the audience yep. today. I'm gonna show it now. Vanish has always been there to make little problems vanish. But now, they're taking on a bigger one. Too many of our clothes are worn just 10 times before they're thrown away and replaced, creating over 90 million tons of waste. But by taking care of the clothes we love for longer, removing stains and protecting colours, we can all waste less and we wear more. See, Vanish is still helping problems disappear. Just bigger. More important ones. So my point for the day is, start with consumer closeness, and you might change the world. Absolutely. And I've got a captive audience here, George, standing room only at the back. What advice would you offer others who are keen to make the same journey that you did? Well, I'm sure there's a lot of amazing brand owners in the audience today and some amazing marketeers with us today. I would like you to take home three things. Bringing the consumer at the heart of what you do and doing what's right for them always is not just a matter of success, it's a matter of survival. Then in turn, your CMI partner is not your data guy and is not your research administrator. Your CMI team is your invaluable partner and your, the objective voice of the consumer within your marketing team and within your organization. And lastly, there's no blueprint on how to do consumer closeness. You have to create your own, but with the right lean and agile mindset and with the right, obviously, methodologies and with the right um, human capital, I'm pretty sure you can create your own. Thank you. Thanks, George. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great presentation. We're out of time for questions, but there's just one question where I'm putting to you for a quick answer because I love the question. It was, in my business, the opinions of senior marketers often went out over impartial insights. Any tips to help us solve this problem? Say that again. So in our business, the person asks, the opinions of senior marketers win over the impartial insights they've been given from a market research firm. Well, it's a matter of culture, isn't it? For me, it's a matter of culture. And you, as I said in the beginning, you don't just wake up and you're like, oh, today I'm going to be consumer-centric and therefore everything is going to be you know, inside-driven. Obviously, you need to start small mm -hmm. and scale up gradually over time. But as you prove the value of consumer-centricity over time, and another thing here is that, obviously, having the right insights and the right access to consumers, etc., is making marketing decision-making easily, mm -hmm. or at least more easy. And therefore, you build that culture over time. So yes, sometimes, of course, you're going to have some very um, passionate stakeholders within senior marketing or senior management who are very passionate about an idea and they really want that idea. But even in this case, you can always just support with framing the idea in the right manner. And that's, again, where insights can contribute. Brilliant answer. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, both of you. That's a fascinating presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.